first generation Mexican American with a career as a licensed clinical social worker. Luis has recently taken on the role as service chief for the Fullerton Adult Older Adult Pact program with the Orange County Healthcare Agency. Luis oversees the provision of mental health services to adults living with a chronic and persistent mental illness who may have a co-occurring substance use disorder and who are experiencing significant impairments in their daily functioning. Daily functioning. Luis previously worked as the lead clinician flash therapist with OC Accept, the first county funded program aid aimed at addressing the behavioral health substance use and public health needs of the LGBTIQ community in Orange County, providing cultural awareness trainings and presentations to various county programs, county contract agencies, and educational institutions. Louise's work focused on increasing providers' understanding and awareness of the issues the LGBTIQ community often struggle with in regards to sexual orientation, gender identity, and family slash social acceptance. Luisa's work has focused on advocating for the inclusion of care to the LGBTIQ community within the Orange County Healthcare Agency mental health system in addition to community partners. <clears throat> Luis also works at Long Beach Memorial and Miller's Children and Women's Hospital as a per diem licensed clinical social worker, providing services to patients receiving complex medical, medical care in addition to addressing barriers to adherence to medical treatment. Luis is a proud graduate of Cal State University Fullerton where he earned his Bachelor's of Science in Human Services in 2009 and his Master's in Social Work in 2012. So let's give him a round of applause. You're a little narcissistic to kind of hear and talk about yourself like that, right? <laughs> <laughs> but, um, you know, I, I heard you guys talk about mental health, specifically kind of bridging the gap in schools, uh, poverty, um, kind of um, providing physical care, uh, addressing cultural issues when it comes to mental health, working with children in mental health. And I think um, that as a representative for the master's program here at Cal State Fullerton in social work, that's something that we really need to address. Um, we re really are kind of focusing on addressing issues in regards to, um, you know, the lack of needs in the community and trying to provide those services there. Uh, and so, Currently, um, I was just recently promoted to a, a HCA Healthcare Agency Service Chief with the Orange County Health Agency, um, and, and this is the forward to PAC clinic. So as you read in the bio, uh, these are clients with a persistent mental health diagnosis. Um, they are adults. We have a program also called um, TAPAC, which is a transitional age youth program, and PAC is a program for a certain community treatment. So basically um, what it is, and I'll go more into detail later on, um, this is a small, a clinician has a small caseload of about 20 clients um, because they are high utilizers of care. Um, and so they can have frequent hospital, psychiatric hospitalizations. They are dealing with a mental health diagnosis or a substance abuse disorder, which is often called co-occurring disorder. Um, and they are often homeless or have lost housing experience um, continuous substance use, and um, they require a little bit more, uh, more care. Um, and so my, my job is to be able to provide guidance, support to uh, my staff. Um, a psychiatrist works under me as well, and, and a nurse. And so I deal with the daily operations of the clinic. Um, when we okay, now I'll go more into detail. Um, in regards to my personal background, um, you know, there are always factors in one's life which contribute to the journey we um, and so for me, I, I come from a Mexican-American background. Um, I'm a first-generation um, graduate student or college student that, um, in my family. Um, and, you know, my, my mom was a single parent. Uh, my parents split up when I was 10 years old. And uh, so I, I, I really kind of um, was parentified at a very early age in terms of being Latino, being the, the adult male in, in the family. Um, having to deal with, you know, Spanish-speaking only parents, um, translating, um, having to go to different appointments, feeling like I needed to sort of uh, provide financially. I was out looking for jobs at the age of 15 because I knew my mom needed the help financially. Um, my parents at one point had bought a home and we had lost our home as a result of the divorce. 
Um, so those are some of the things that kind of I grew up with and experienced. You know, I experienced you know, somewhat of a of a pretty good early uh, upbringing, and then having to move in to a room with with a cousin uh, because that was family, and they helped out losing their home. Um, so that's a little bit of my of my background. Um, I had two younger siblings um, who kind of looked up to me as well, and so again, having that feeling like you need to to be responsible for not only a, a parent but also two younger siblings can be pretty heavy for for a kid, you know, especially at ten. Um, and then trying to go to school, um, try to get good grades. Um, you know, there's a lot that, that kind of goes into into that. Um, limited support, understand. Oh, sorry. Limited support, understanding of the educational system. So, you know, as as a you know student growing up, I knew that I had to complete high school. My parent, my, my mom always told me like you, you have to complete high school. She didn't understand why. Uh, you know, she didn't. She came from Mexico when she was 18. Um, she had worked here all her life, but never really completed her education or even learned English. She didn't even know how to drive at this point uh, to this age. Um, but you know, she she always knew that school was kind of was a way out. So she always pushed school, and I think that I, I always appreciated that she always emphasized her focus, specifically on, on all of our siblings, but but on me because I was the oldest to go to school because that, that's what that's what was going to get me ahead right, in her mind. She didn't understand how, she didn't understand why, but she knew you have to go to school because that's how you're going to get ahead. Um, and so I, um, you know, I. I, I Barely graduated high school at, at, at one point, but I transferred over to uh, Fullerton College, and I'll kind of go into that as well. Um, but and I kind of already talked about the family and cultural expectations. But if you can go on the next slide, so um, you know I transferred to, to Fullerton College right out of high school. Um, I think I was 17 when I graduated, only because age, whatever. But I, I turned 18 once I once I went to Fullerton College, um, and I was in 1999, so it's a long time ago. <laughs> Uh, you know, I explored various degrees. I didn't know what I wanted to do. I, I started off as um, computer science because that's where the money was at. Um, then I did advertising, and then I found out that I couldn't draw, so I couldn't do that. Um, I then did um, Chicano Chicano studies, and I kind of got a passion for learning about my culture a little bit. So I think that that's kind of where I probably would have stayed in that area hadn't I been laid off from my first job. So I was working part time, um, almost full time, going to school in the morning and then working from 12 to 9 at night. Um, bought my first car, um, kind of helping out at home, um, doing great. You know, I, was, I feel like I was, I felt like I was going to school doing, doing what I had to do, um, but I was laid off and I had a brand new car payment and I had bills I needed to pay. So I stopped going to school for about five years. So I was at Fullerton College, stopped going to school. Um, my job was in Irvine, actually. Um, so I had to, uh, had to kind of figure that out on my own. Um, having to uh, adjust going to work in at, at 7 o'clock in the morning, getting out at maybe like 4, 4.30. I, I didn't know much about like night classes. Um, didn't really explore it, to be honest with you. At that point, I was like, okay, I need to work and make money and pay my car and help out at home. and have a group of friends and go out and kind of dedicated to kind of living my own life a little bit, kind of forgot about school for a while. Um, during the, the time where I returned to community college, I was actually uh, looking for something a little bit closer to home. So I decided, through, through the group of friends that I had, I decided to, they encouraged me to apply for a job with the county. And I finally, um, I think I was like 18, 19, maybe 20, 21 when I, when I first applied for my first county job. And I got hired, and that's kind of where, um, you know, I was like, okay, I think it's closer to home, let me kind of, I have time to sort of not drive in traffic, I worked right in front of the block, um, I used to, I, I worked, started working off, um, working at CBU Pro Probation, a clinical evaluation guidance unit, and I'll go more into detail about that in a little bit, but, um, you know, it was close to home, not Irvine, I didn't have to sit in traffic, so I, I started to consider the possibility that going back to community college after work was possible. I could do it. I wouldn't have to be stuck in traffic driving home. Um, so that's when I decided to return to the college. Um, you know, I, I completed my associate's degree in um, sociology in 2007, 
And I think, you know, everybody's different. I, um, I, I explored uh, various degrees while in community college. And, you know, at, at that age, right after high school, you're kind of just doing your own thing and figuring out who you are. And this is something that I even have a conversation with a lot of um, the clients that I used to have, and that it's okay for you not to know what it is that you want to do. Um, I think community college really gives you that opportunity to explore that, those degrees so for those who want to work with, with you know, um, in high school. I think that's kind of a realistic conversation to have. Um, that, you, that it's okay to figure it out, and that if you take a couple of classes, that's, that's fine. Um, but when I went back, I was more, probably more or less 25 when I decided to go back, or maybe a little bit older. Um, and so I kind of had a different mentality. I was like, I just need to get this done. I, I, I know that I'm working. Um, I was hired as an office technician. So it's, you know, kind of low-level entry work with the county, and I was like, I need to make more money. How am I going to be able to get more money? And so I, I think I started to take school a lot more serious once I was a little bit older in community college. That's just my journey. Everybody else, else's journey is different. Um, so I completed my associate's degree in 2007, and then I applied while working at another job, and I'll go more into detail, um, to the Human Services Department here at Castle Fullerton. And that's kind of when I really got introduced to the idea of, of helping others and how I can you know, assist and provide services to, to clients who probably have gone through the similar experiences that I had gone through as a child or even as an adolescent and, and kind of giving back. Um, so I, I, I completed my, um, my, my bachelor's degree in 2009. I did a lot of online classes. I, went, um, I also completed some prerequisites through post on Community College just to try to graduate. Um, you know, I think online classes are, are amazing because it really does give us more flexibility. Um, especially if we are working full time, because throughout this whole time, I was I've always been working full time. And um, I completed my my degree in human, in human services, and I went straight into my master's. Um, I went to an informational session. I would encourage you, if, if you are considering um, the social work program, to go to one of the information sessions if you haven't done so already. Um, and I learned more about the program, what it was, what it, where where I can work um, after I was done. Um, and I, I went straight into the master's program um, in 2009. I think I, I was still on academic probation because my, my, I needed to complete one requirement that I had to do um, through Coastal Community College and if they hadn't posted on my time degree audit until it had posted, I was officially accepted. So for the first semester at, at Cal State Fullerton for my master's program, I was still on academic, pro not academic probation, but it was like a, tentative acceptance, but they, they allowed it. Um, and so I, I went into my master's program. I was working full time, had had, had several promotions or, or changes at work. Um, my work for, for me, fortunately, was very supportive in, in kind of going into social work. Um, so I was able to work full time, go to school three uh, part time. So it was a uh, three year program here at Castle Fullerton, so three night classes and have an internship. My second and third year, I had a 20 hour a week internship. So it, it was all a juggling, balancing act. And it was pretty tough for the last two years. Um, but I finally graduated in 2012 and um, I've been working um, in social work ever since. Okay, so why did I decide to go to social work? Um, I think it all starts with, um, you know, when, where I first started working. I started working at clinical evaluation by MCA as an office technician. and um, for those who, of you who don't know, um, this was a CU probation. This was juvenile hall right in front of the block. Um, these were kids who had been incarcerated um, because of a substance abuse or a mental health diagnosis. And, and CU, or Clinical Evaluation Guidance Unit, specifically went out to juvenile hall to address the mental health issues of the, the, the kids that were in there. Um, if they were having a crisis, either they're locked up, they're away from their family, their first incarceration, they're having uh, maybe their first psychotic break, hearing voices, seeing things. Maybe they're it's a drug-induced psychosis. Maybe it's it's you know the drugs that kind of cause the hallucinations and they're, and they're kind of reacting to it. Uh, maybe it's depression. Maybe you know if, if you've worked with kids before, they go through a lot. Maybe they were struggling with. Shame and guilt of being sexually abused, physically abused. You know, clinicians were going out there to respond to that. 
Um, suicide attempts, hospitalizations, those all occurred while in Juvenile Hall. And so what I was doing was I was processing all the information, whether it's documentation minutes, um, making sure that everything was compliant with like the regulations, and just entering the information into the system. I was an office technician. Um, and there were, when I was there, there were maybe two clinicians who did not, uh, who only spoke Spanish. And the rest, you know, were, were various ethnic um, sort of um, ethnicities. And I said, you know, most of the population in juvenile hall, they're Latino, you know, for the most part, um, not to stigmatize. But I, and, and there, were com there were some themes that were coming up in regards to like religion and culture that I felt other clinicians didn't really understand. And so that's sort of what started the planting the seed for me to try to go back into, to, to go into a degree that I would be able to be that clinician to help out and understand these kids. I wanted to be able to understand why there were religious themes or, or why parents were a little bit too enmeshed or why they, they you know, parents chose not to talk about certain issues because of shame or guilt. Um, you know, if, if you're Latino, um, many, many are Catholic, and so some of religious themes associated with that, and so the hallucinations, and a lot of clinicians didn't understand where these hallucinations came from. Um, so that, that's kind of what, what started the seed for me. But I wanted to be able to make a, a difference um, in the community that I lived and worked in. Um, I wanted to work with the Latino community, and, and again, limited visibility. There was only two clinicians that spoke Spanish at the time. Um, and so I wanted to be one of those clinicians. I wanted to go in there. And as an office technician, I would go into the hall and kind of have to pick up the paperwork and I would see the kids. And it was, it was, cool. it was for me, it was cool. Um, and then we also worked with Orangewood. We provided support to Orangewood. How many of you ever heard of Orangewood? Orangewood Children's Home. So if there's a social worker that's going to go in and take out, um, take the kid, remove the kid from custody, um, and they can't find placement with a family member, they will go to a cottage in Orangewood, which is right by the block. Um, and so a lot of these kids also, too, were having emotional disturbances, um, either depressed, upset, you're being removed from your home. Um, of course, you're going to be upset or depressed. Um, so I wanted to be able to be, you know, helping. That's what I wanted to do. I wanted to help. Um, I wanted to provide advocacy. And another role that I had as an eligibility technician, um, you know, I, uh, I was coming in and I was um, determining eligibility for uh, clients for Medicare. So these were, these were CCS, it's California Children's Services. How many of you have heard of California Children's Services? So if, you, um, if a parent has a child who qualifies for Medi-Cal and they need specialized medical care, they need to, and specialized medical, medical care could be uh, maybe physical therapy, okay? Or it could be that they have a congenital heart failure and they need to continue follow the specialist or they have a cleft lip palate, um, or they have, um, some kids were, were HIV positive. Um, just specialized medical care, they would have to come into our office and get eligibility, financial eligibility, to make sure that they continue with Medi-Cal. Um, and I would, I would process that information. And so when I would come, when, when parents would come in, I would, you know, my job was to solely process the Medi-Cal eligibility and make sure that they qualified for our program. But there were so many other factors that these parents would come in and sit with me that I was like, I don't know what to do. How can I advocate? How can I help? How can I provide support to the parent that's crying because their child may or may not die, or their child are, are their children are in and out of surgeries and they're they're upset, or they have to take time off of work because they um, have to take care of their child and they don't know how to pay the rent. Um, or that, that, that sort of the depression and that struggle that goes with all that. I, I didn't know what to do. I was just there to process the, this information, and I, I decided, that's, I, I, that's kind of when I decided to, to pursue my master's degree. Um, but providing advocacy to others, I wanted to, to be that person to, to be able to do that. And for me, I, I sort of, um, you know, again, found myself working, um, you know, in, in the field. Um, I, found my, I found myself in social work. I could have easily have gotten a job at, um, you know, as an office technician with public works or with, you know, um, social services agency. I don't know. I just 
I just naturally found myself working where I was working, and that sort of lit the fire in me to pursue my degree. Um, so that's that's kind of my journey as to why I decided to go into social work. So what is social work? I'm not going to go into detail about the you know the different levels or areas we can do Q and A after. I think you know for the most part I've been able to work in in various agencies, so we can kind of have a Q and A after. But the field of social work utilizes social theories to understand human problems in an effort to help improve people's lives and to do and to improve society as a whole. Social workers can specialize in particular areas such as helping children, adults, older adults. It's a huge need for older adults. Um, those struggling with the mental health with mental health problems, addiction, and or both. Okay. Let me hit the next slide. So, what do we do as social workers? We act as advocates for the for our clients. For our clients, we educate clients and teach them new skills. We link clients to essential resources within the community. We protect vulnerable clients and ensure that their best interests are observed. We counsel clients who need support and assistance. We research social problems to look for remedies. That sounds a lot like what all of you said you guys wanted to do. Whether we're out, you know, in social work, we can go, we can do so many things. You know, I started, you know, seeing clients and providing therapy. Um, so I've been a therapist, I ran a program, I've created a program, I've helped create a program. Um, I, I'm now running a clinic. And I think social work really prepares you to work in different areas to make a bigger impact. Um, whether you want to provide that direct care or whether you want to oversee the provision of services to an agency or to a community, social work really does allow you to go anywhere. So where can we work? Schools, hospitals, courts, uh, correctional facilities, Foster care and adoption agencies, international aid organizations, military bases, private practice in centers, so you can have your own private practice, child welfare agencies, nursing homes, and adult day centers. Okay. So I kind of want to talk to you about my career path a little bit and, and the areas that I've worked in, and, and I think that will kind of lend um, more um, will kind of allow us to kind of talk about more of what we've done or what I've been able to do as a social worker. So, you know, again, I started working at Clinical Evaluation and Guidance Unit, and that was a probation. Uh, I wasn't providing direct care, but I was sort of talking to parents who would come in and have to sign information um, for their for their child. So that's kind of the, the direct care, and then I would I would observe or talk to clinicians who were going out there seeing kids in probation. So that's kind of where I first started. Um, I then uh, was promoted to an eligibility technician with California Children's Services, um, bless you. and again, that's that's where the, the connecting with other clients and feeling helpless. I really felt helpless because I didn't know what to do with these parents who weren't having issues with their, you know, in their in their everyday lives. Okay. So during this time, um, me and another um, coworker actually kind of found this passion. And that's when, when I started to, to apply to, I had already obtained my associate's degree, and I was applying for my bachelor's in human services. How many of you have, have do you know what the human services degree program is here? Okay, so you start doing your internship hours, and you have to do your, you know, okay, all that. So you know that you, you have to start going and, and doing all that stuff. So that's kind of where, where I was like, okay, maybe I can do this, you know, go and, and provide that, those hours. Um, so I, during that time, I was promoted to uh, promoted again to um, mental health specialist with children and youth services outreach and engagement. So we're talking about engagement. We talked about in being engaging and wanting to do that in somebody else, somebody else right here. So with outreach and engagement, what we would do is we would go out to the riverbeds. Right now, we're having a lot of issues with um, well, we we had um, with people living on the riverbeds. So we would go out to the riverbeds uh, to try to engage clients who had not been linked to mental health. Or who, in in our assessment, we noticed that they needed to be connected to mental health services. I specifically focus in going to schools. I work with a lot of school counselors who, in their everyday work, would identify students who were having these behavioral problems. Or hey, you know, they they would call me, um, and they'd be like, hey, Luis, this, this one student was doing so good. And now, like within the course of the semester or the quarter, the grades have dropped down. Um, she seems with they seem withdrawn. 
um, or they're having a lot of behavioral problems in the classroom. Um, do you mind coming out and just kind of talking and seeing kind of where, where what's going on? And so uh, I would go into, into the schools here in Orange County and I would engage students and kind of talk to them. You know, when you were, um, when, when I would go out there, I would try to see what was going on with the, with the students. They were either having um, emotional problems, suicidal thoughts. Um, some of them were victims of sexual abuse by family members, uh, physical abuse, substance use. So I would have to try to connect with the parents at that point and try to encourage the parents who didn't really understand what mental health was um, to take their kids to a county agency and receive mental health services. So a lot of education to not only the student, but also the parent. Um, and so we, we were trying to find you know, resources, whether it was us going to the home and, and providing that education and maybe even giving them the rise to the clinic and helping and showing how to do that. Um, that's kind of what, what I did as a mental health specialist for about five years. Okay. And during that time, I was working on, um, I finished and completed my master's degree. So um, my boss, she was also a licensed clinical social worker, and she was super supportive, allowed me to um, you know, change my schedule around so that I can work four days uh, a week, 10-hour shifts. And then Friday and Saturday, I would do my internship hours, um, 20 hours a week. So that was tough for a while. Um, so once I graduated, I was uh, transferred over to OC except as a mental health specialist. To earn my clinical hours. So I was starting with social work, you have to um, apply for your number with the Board of Behavioral Health Services. You get a number and you have to get supervision. So somebody who is already licensed has to provide supervision for you. And that means that you, you're, they're providing you with, with sort of feedback and support, guiding you on how to work with clients. When you have a client that comes into your door and you're working in mental health, you don't know what type of client you're going to get. Now, during this time, you know, my internships, what they consisted of, I worked at a foster adoption agency. So I've had clients who had behavioral health issues, whether they were, uh, they had like, some cognitive disabilities and needed redirection, whether it was autism or developmental delay. Um, if we're thinking about uh, foster adoption, you know, some of these kids are removed from the home or removed from a, a parent who may be using substances. If a parent is using substances, the child most likely is going to suffer from some sort of impairment, um, whether it's um, you know, withdrawing after birth, uh, drug, the drug, drug withdrawal, withdrawal um, or they may have suffered physical or sexual abuse in the home, um, neglect, severe neglect. Um, and so these kids were, were having behavioral health issues as a result of that. You're providing support not only to the child, but also to the parent who may not know what to do. Some parents are fostering temporarily for a while, um, and they're, they're taking on a child who is having severe behavioral health problems, and they're just like, I don't know what to do. And as a social worker, depending on where you decide to go, what you would want to avoid is having the foster parent give up the child, because that re-traumatizes the child. It, 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 it enforces rejection in the child. So we, try to, we were trying to provide support to not only you know, address the issues that were going on with, with, with the child, but also providing support to the families. Um, some families also wanted to continue, which is foster adopt, to um, foster the child initially. Um, in the back end, there's a lot of things that go on in the court. Um, parents go through a process of trying to regain custody of the child. So uh, whether they're going, and this is kind of where also you can work in the court, as a, a court social worker, and that is, you know, making sure that the parents are following the parenting classes, doing their substance abuse classes. If they need anger management, you're finding all these resources for the parents so that they can meet this requirement so that they can get their child back. Okay, um, so that's kind of just what I. What was my first internship? My second internship was. Um, a court mandated program for adults who had a. Um, criminal offense, and they were met in, and they were homeless. So they had conducted a, a, a criminal offense because of a mental health diagnosis. So 
some of the clients would, would say, hey, I, I, or they, were, they would be so paranoid that they would think that somebody was, was trying to hurt them or, or that this public official, this, this, this law person was trying to, to hurt them and they would attack or they would graffiti or they would um, be out in the middle of the street naked um, or they would assault somebody. Um, and so as a result, they would um, be arrested, they would go to um, homeless court, it was, it's called homeless court with the Orange County Health Agency, and the judge, who was very open to mental health and providing care, would then transfer the, child, the, the, the client over to this program, it was called WIC Choices, Whatever It Takes, and we would provide the therapy component of it. Um, we would run groups, um, we would be addressing the mental health diagnosis, um, or substance abuse, and once they completed that program, their charges were reduced. So there's an incentive, and they were they were provided with housing support, um, and uh, they were given other resources to kind of sustain housing after they had been discharged. Um, so those are my two relationships. <laughs> yeah, sorry. So there's a little bit a lot, but um, you know, so then I was uh, promoted to um, primary intake clinical social worker one with the adult mental health clinic in Siena. So my role there was to assess um, clients for mental health services. So every single client that was seeking mental health support or services, psychiatric support or case management services, I would, I would assess every single client. I would take every phone call I would come in, I would deal with hospitalization, so if a client was being released from a psychiatric hospital after a suicide attempt, after a homicide attempt, um, or because they, had, uh, they were greatly disabled, meaning that they couldn't take care of themselves despite them having the resources to do so, I would get that phone call, and I would have to schedule and assess that client. Um, we would conduct suicide risk assessments in psychiatric hold. So if a client came into our office and started um, saying, I'm going to walk out of this building and I'm going to go run to traffic, we would have to assess, make sure that there was, if there was a plan. Um, we are LPS certified, so um, I, would, I have the power to, well, I have the power to card uh, to, to put you in a hold if I, was, if I determined that you were a risk to yourself, to others, or greater disabled. Um, and then I would act as a, so a lot of meetings, so I would go to psychiatric um, hospitals and kind of coordinate services with, with our agencies to make sure that, you know, protocols were in place when referring participants over to our clinic. So I did that for about a year. And then um, I was asked to come back to OCCEPT because one of the clinicians, two of the clinicians that were there um, received promotions and they left and I they needed to build agency. So with those two accepts, uh, I was providing short-term therapy to clients struggling with their gender identity and sexual orientation. Um, I was providing verification letters to medical providers so that clients seeking hormone replacement therapy services could receive treatment. So um, you know, this is kind of important for a lot of clients who are struggling with their gender identity. Um, and so we would be providing these letters and they can sort of start the process of, of transitioning. Uh, I was providing training and presentations to various community agencies, county and contract programs, and educational institutions aimed at increasing awareness of mental health within the LGBTIQ community. I've um, taught classes here, at, I guest lectured here at Cassie Cullerton for their social work program. I think this, is my, this was my third year doing it with Dr. Bailey, um, teaching her class um, on LGBTIQ competency. Um, we've taught at USC, we've taught at uh, Chapman University, I guess lecture at Chapman University, Saddleback College, um, just to kind of increase providers' awareness on what issues the LGBTI community faces, so that if a client is coming in to, to um, you know, a counselor or to a, um, you know, school, they're able to, you know, the providers are able to identify, okay, so what's going on? Are you having gender identity issues? Let's refer you to maybe somebody who can address those issues. And then I served as the expert for the Orange County Health Agency on LGBTIQ cultural competency. So I've been on a lot of uh, meetings and, and sort of trying to um, coordinate services for uh, participants in our program. This program didn't, didn't exist. So how many are you are familiar with NHS and funding? Mental Health Services Act. So uh, social workers will probably find out that um, 
with the Mental Health Services Act, it's basically anybody who makes over a million dollars, they get taxed 10%, and that money goes into creating new mental health programs. So um, there are mental health programs are, that are in existence, but if there is an identified need, um, they will. Um, this money is set aside to sort of address that need. And, and that kind of created a program called Prevention Early Intervention with Orange County Health Agency. And so we started off as an innovative program. So we were a test pilot program. We identified a program, we gathered data, we presented the data to what we call a steering committee. We, we uh, me and my um, colleagues were instrumental in gathering data and presenting it to sort of uh, show that this that the LGBT community was a was an area that needed to to receive services was an area of focus that we needed to to provide services to, um, and as a result, our program was picked up after providing data, and um, it got picked up and it got transitioned into prevention early intervention. Um, so you know, for, for those of you who are maybe thinking about program development or um, sort of implementation of services, social work also provides you with the opportunity to do that. Okay. And this guy is gonna be the last slide, so go back. Um, so during, I, when I was working with, uh, with OCXF, I also actually took on a job um, with Long Beach Memorial Miller's Children's Hospital. So I'm also a per diem social worker right now. I work um, maybe two to three days a month at the hospital. So what we're doing is um, I'm addressing complex medical issues. If you're thinking of anything that happens on the news, pretty pretty big in terms of like news headlines, it's most likely going to be at our hospital. Okay, um, we're pretty uh, kind of a level I think level one or level two trauma center. So anything that, that happens usually goes to to our hospital, and we have basically three hospitals within within Long Beach. We have the pediatric, which is Miller's Children. We have women in delivery, and then we have the regular adults um, tower. So we, um, we provide care to uh, adults, pediatrics, emergency room, palliative care, which is end of life care, people who are dying, uh, we provide that support, and women in delivery. So during the weekend, um, there's basically only four social workers covering the entire hospital. So it's pretty, if you're, if you're into like a fast paced, you know, you get a phone call, there's a code blue, or there's a, a trauma that happens, the hospital is an amazing thing. You're not a doctor, but you're definitely in there, um, especially in the emergency room, you're, you're in there with the doctors, with paramedics, stuff happening, you're gathering data, asking if they want family contacted, um, if, if it's, um, you know, if a client comes in because they're in a car accident and they can't talk, you're talking to police, gathering information so that you can try to make that effort to contact the family. Um, contact the family, bring them in, you provide that crisis support. It's fast-paced, okay? Um, with adults, you know, so we're, um, with adults, it's a lot of sort of adjustment to illness, whether you have a new cancer diagnosis, whether you um, have been diagnosed with diabetes, whether they have to amputate, um, whether you are diagnosed with STI or HIV, um, whether it's trauma. Uh, some, some clients have come in with gunshot wounds. Um, I've dealt with women who have been physically abused, and we try to connect them to domestic violence shelters or follow police reports. Uh, with pediatrics, a lot of um, Department of Children and Family Services referrals and phone calls. Um, we've had, um, you know, a lot of children who have passed away, uh, a lot of children who have been victims of physical abuse, whether they've been shaken, shaken baby syndrome, um, kind of following or, or kind of understanding the process with that, having a contact with law enforcement. Um, again, DCFS maybe removed a child from the home. Um, Emergency room, we have a lot of psychiatric patients that sometimes come in, a lot of homeless people. Um, we once had a client who drove up and um, he walked out and said, I've been shot and trailed blood into the, into, the, into the emergency room. It's always an exciting place to work in, 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 at the hospital. Uh, but again, you know, he wouldn't provide any information. We can't contact next of kin. We have to coordinate with police, try to get those resources, public safety, making sure that our staff is is safe. Um, there's a lot that goes into to being a, a per diem social worker. And then women in delivery, you're dealing with you know women who are struggling with maybe postpartum depression, 
Maybe they're, they are physically abused. Maybe they have a history of depression. Um, ensuring that the babies may be safe to be discharged with the mom. Um, sometimes there's fetal demise, meaning that the child dies in birth. And so you're going in there with the child um, you know, in the room with the mom and, and providing that support, that can request support. Um, the hospital will give you all of that. Okay? And, and it's, you know, you're basically providing that support. Okay? Um, lastly, um, so I, I was fortunate enough to be promoted to um, Service chief. So again, it's it's um, oversees a clinic which provides mental health services to adults living with chronic and persistent mental illness. Clients may be struggling with a co-occurring substance abuse disorder. Clients must be eligible for services. They must experience significant impairments in their daily functioning. Um, the criteria: they have to have two or or more psychiatric hospitalizations within a 12 month period, or an incarceration as a result of the mental health diagnosis. And I help manage a team of clinicians, mental health specialists, peer, special, uh, peer mentors, uh, psychiatrists, and a registered nurse, and all to provide those services to the client. And we have to, I have to ensure that uh, my staff is, is, compli um, is compliant with, med with state medical guidance guidelines. So auditing charts, making sure that documentation is, is accurate. And um, I oversee the daily operation of the clinic. So yesterday I was working, um, a client was, um, you know, needing to be hospitalized and I had to stay over. So I was asked to come yesterday and why I didn't because I thought I wouldn't have been able to make it because I would not call. Um, so just, you know, it's always, it's always a, a, an interesting day at the time. But that's basically all that I have in terms of what I do. Um, I think if you have any questions, I'm, you know, I'm open to answering them if you're thinking about entering this field and any concerns or hesitations or anything. Well, oh, let's give a round of applause. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, that was about 40 minutes, so we're going to do like a 20 to 30 minute Q&A, and I know all of you have great questions, every alumni guest speaker that we've had. so. Um, Louise is open, and again, we could do one-on-ones after we like wrap up and take a picture. You could continue to go up to him one-on-one -on -one until we have to leave here at 4.30. So yeah, now it's open, we're still. <laughs> yeah, it seems like you're doing a lot. That's pretty good. What's your next goal? Um, well, right now I just uh, I just got took on the submission position, so that, I think that was one of my goals to, to be able to be in management. Um, you know, I, I don't know, maybe um, probably being a little bit more in, in, uh, involved in program implementation. You can always um, go into uh, program management. Um, I, I think my next goal would probably be maybe teaching. I wouldn't mind teaching, whether it's here or at Cal State Long, Long Beach, I'm better. Um, but um, you know, I think that, that would be my next goal. I, I would still maintain the hospital job, my current job, but um, I like balancing and juggling multiple things. Um, and so I think that would probably be my next goal, kind of maybe teaching. Um, I don't want to do private practice. That's something that I'm not, not really interested in doing, but maybe teaching. Yes. So how many hours do you do? How many hours do you do? So, well, the, the clinic is my full-time job. Um, the hospital, um, I'm sort of required as part of my contract to do maybe two days out of the, um, out of the month. So when I first started, um, you know, it's, it's exciting. You know, you're, you're in there, you have your, your nice little cool lab coat, and you're just kind of going and doing all that stuff. And um, I was working maybe every Saturday and Sunday, maybe like maybe six or eight days a month. So uh, just on the weekend. So Saturday, Sunday, Saturday, Sunday, Saturday, Sunday. Um, but I liked it. But after a while, it's like, okay, maybe I need to kind of, I need my own like social life. So I needed to kind of calm down and step back. But right now, it's only two days a month. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's 40 hours, well, 40 hours a week. Yeah. I try not to. I think when, I think when we're, when we initially start off, because we, we have to be able to, to do a lot of stuff. And we have, we have to know that that when work ends at five, it has to it has to end at five. We really 
there really is nothing that you can do um, after for the client. Um, and so that takes practice, but right now, no, I don't. The only, the only thing is, you know, maybe, maybe documentation should be over, um, but it's more like protocol and procedures. Nothing client related, it's more like, okay, maybe I just started this new job, so I was told I have to, you know, brush up on special incident reports, which are in the event that something major happens at the clinic, like um, uh, staff is assaulted or something like that, there's protocols and procedures. So maybe printing that out and kind of reading it on my spare time at home. But that's like the, the, the most that I've ever taken home. Um, I think with the clinic, um, as a service chief, you, you, you will be expected to take some stuff home. Only in regards to yesterday, there was a, so at my day ended at six. But my staff had to do a met escort to one of our clients to one of the hospitals. So I'm I'm providing support to my staff even after my day is over. So being being on call that way. Yeah. But other than that, that's, that's the most that I do. Um, what do you do for your self care? Another um, question we like that. Well, you know, I, I you do yoga. Mm -hmm. I like doing boxing, so I usually do boxing five days a week. Um, in hearts, I usually would go after work, uh, but now with this new job, I have to go in the morning, so I have to wake up at five thirty and kind of do that. So um, yeah, but that's that's kind of good. Just kind of balancing self care. It's man going bowling with friends. Um, you know, it's it's sort of just making sure that that, that balance. Um, I was working six seven days a month on the weekends, and I was like, okay, that's a little bit too much. So I need to maybe. You know, spend some time, go out with friends. Um, I like hiking. Peter Strang is always fun to do a little bit self care from the Orange County. Um, so just kind of doing more physical activities when I have the opportunity. And just a, oh, go ahead, Dan. Did you have any experience in ABA therapy with or with the problem? Are you? I didn't have any specific training, um, but I think when when, we're, when I was working at my at my internship for uh, it's called Kinship Center. Um, I don't know if it's still around, but they we would have a lot of clients with autism um, or with you know severe cognitive cognitive developmental developmental um, delays. Um, as an intern, we would get training on how to deal with it. Whether it's there's a program called Triple P. I don't know if you've heard of it. Um, it's there's certain interventions that you get to learn along the way as a trainee that the, that the clinic or the agency will provide to deliver those specific interventions for clients with behavioral, with behavioral issues. So um, the thing with social work is that you get to specialize. So if you choose to do so, um, most of us choose to go into mental health because it's sort of a natural fit, but um, Castic Fullerton has a has a children's track and it has the, the mental health track. So uh, if, if that's a, a goal that you would want to want to do, I think one of my professors was actually worked at regional center for a while. So um, he was he did some sort of social work um, um, work there, social work there, uh, and then did more management for sort of like delivering of services. But you get to specialize. Some um, let's see, um, I specialize in mental health. Um, I had two of my my colleagues, um, Melissa, she actually works at Miller's Children's Hospital with me and it's connections so she was able to get me in. Um, but she she works now with um, working with the regional center for some of the patients at the hospital who are receiving like medical care. Um, so she helps connect them with like tasks, which is IP writing and all that stuff. Um, but she she chose to do children in medical. Um, another friend of mine, Diana, she worked with um, going out and doing assess assessments in the home to determine if the child was safe to stay there. So she, she did children. Who else? Um, my other friend, Tammy, works with uh, transitional age youth. So it's 18 to 26 year olds who are struggling with mental health. So it's more mental health. Um, my other friend, Kathy, um, she was older when she, she entered the program. She was maybe in her 50s. Um, and she always had uh, a passion to deal with more like hoarding behavior and older adults. Um, so that's kind of what she did. Um, my coworker, uh, Quang, he also works in uh, adults. 
And for me, I was fortunate enough that my cohort was super small. So there was 12 of us. Yeah, we were one of the first like county programs to kind of coordinate with Castle Fullerton and um, and social and the social uh, social work department and county. And so these were we were all county employees working in the field. So we are we had that experience, and so we all we worked in some sort of area. Um, but we we are really we are a really close group of friends because we really become really close. Um, with your, with your cohort. So, um, yeah, so keep in contact with the most of them. And my friend, my other friend Maria, she became a school social worker. But she's a counselor doing, doing that. And you become specialized um, in whatever you want to do. That's kind of like the beauty of it. And I think that's why the, the internships are so important. Initially, they'll, they'll ask you, what is, it, what is it that you're doing or what is it that you're interested in? And they'll try to place you in that field to help build your your kind of your strengths. But they will also place you somewhere completely different to teach you different skills. Because you know the truth of the matter is you don't know who's gonna come into your, your door. Whether it's somebody with maybe developmental delays, um, and if they're they may have a different cultural background than you, um, you're kind of having to understand that. Um, you're not only dealing with the developmental delay, but maybe a Latino family who is maybe feeling shame or a Vietnamese family that um, may be feeling sh uh, shame. You know, we've dealt with clients, um, there's a program called Rokatika, uh, VCM's OC, Korean uh, Community Services, and a lot of that is, is kind of focused on addressing, you know, API community and, and the shame associated with mental health. It, you know, those are real issues. And so when you are decide to maybe work with, with um, ABA clients, you're not only dealing with, with your client, you're dealing with the family it's a whole family systems. So it's always complex over there. Two quick questions. Sure. No, go ahead. Um, it seems like you're in a lot of fast-paced environment. Which one was, which out of all the places that you've been at, um, where would you say have been your more slower rates and why was it like that? Is it because of the environment or because uh, the that you do. Mm -hmm. I think the, the, the slower, and I wouldn't necessarily call it slower pace. Um, OC Accept was was more of a private practice setting, whereas you know these are specific clients, these are clients who are struggling with their gender identity and or sexual orientation. So it's you know not a lot of people are, are struggling with their sexual orientation or gender identity. I would still have a a pretty pretty significant caseload, um, but it was much more fast fast paced. You know, we can't really force a client to come out, or a client may identify as being, you know, identifying as, as transgender, um, and they we, we can't force that transition. It's whenever whenever they're ready. Kind of understanding that we have to kind of work with with what they how they want to proceed in this journey. Um, and so that can be a little bit more slow paced, dealing every day, individual therapy, maybe once a week, every twice a week, versus mental health, if there's always something else going on. Um, you know, I, I walk into the hospital and I'm just like, oh, I'm really gonna, I'm really gonna earn my pay today. Because it's like, as soon as I walk in, I'm handed my, my phone and it, it goes off. Um, hospital though is gonna be very fast paced. But um, I think with those except it was a little bit more slower paced, which I think did allow me to do the hospital at the same time. Uh, and that's why I've been cutting back a little bit more as I transition into this new role because it, it's a little bit more intense. Um, but um, OC except also allowed me to sort of work on the importance of gathering data and presenting that data to show a program is working and receive funding. So we talked about grants and, and all that stuff. So grant writing is another another kind of you know factor that, that social workers do. Um, and then also it allowed me to do various presentations out in the community. So probably maybe two, three years ago, I would totally be uncomfortable being up here talking to people, whether it's small. It's just you know, you're, you're out there talking about specific subjects, subjects that are not necessarily acceptable, um, and, and you're, you're having to kind of educate, and questions come up. So your comfort level does, does get better with time. 
Um, it's given me also opportunities to, to, to guest lecture and, and maybe consider teaching. That's kind of what my next goal would probably be. Um, so it was a little bit more, more slower pace, but it definitely sort of put my career in a, in a really mo mobile uh, forward, like mobility-wise. It was very mobile. Um, and I think that's kind of what also helped me get this, this solution. Yes. I had a follow-up sure. about, well, now that you also mentioned about your cohort being close and I asked about self-care, I mean, what did you do in graduate school to, while you were in school, to take care of yourselves, you, your cohort, and mm -hmm. just being close, did that help? And also did the program itself, I know I've heard um, that some social work programs, if not all, um, kind of make you, as part of their program, concentrate on self-care. Yeah, like I think that. our program was was very important. That was something, that was a, a self-care is sort of like the theme throughout the course of the three years. It's like that's kind of all they talk about, self-care, self-care, mm -hmm. self-care, because you're, you can get burnt out. You know, you can definitely get burnt You're dealing with a lot of stuff. You know, you're dealing with somebody else's issues. We all have our own issues. You know, I kind of briefly talked about my background. You know, we have we have our own, our own lives that we have to deal with, whether, you know, a breakup or a car accident or a loss of job. And, and on top of that, you're having to go maybe talk to a client who's maybe dealing with that or 10 times worse. You can't take that on. So you need to find that balance. Um, so, so definitely self-care was something that was always sort of encouraged in my, in my cohort. Um, I think I've learned that throughout the years, I'm sort of, I function well with stress. <laughs> I don't know if that's good. So I was still, you know, like I said, working full time, going to school three times a day, or three times a week, my internship, and I was still going out. So it's just like a, ba I know, it's just a balance. Um, that's just the way I work. I don't know. I've always kind of always worked that way. Um, you know, I, I think I, I deal well with a lot. I don't know if I can continue doing that as I get older, but um, yeah, I, I've just always been kind of, I definitely did my self-care, whether it was like spending time with friends, um, but I would, I would still go out like Saturday and Sunday, and the homework, and graduated like really hard GPA, <laughs> so I was still pretty high functioning. But that, again, that's just everybody. But I think, you know, what, what helped me, I think, is that as you get older, you're kind of more focused. I feel like you're more focused in what you want, and you take it more serious. Not that there's anything, like, not that that's not the same thing with um, when people, with people who are younger, but for me, it's like, you know, I know that I had to go out, but it's like, or that I wanted to go out, but I had my priorities set. Those were my priorities. Work, school, graduating, um, and yeah, I would go out and have fun, but it was, it was not like crazy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Um, we have time for a few more questions. Maybe like two or three. This presentation or anything. I know. Okay, go ahead, Diana. Yeah. What was your hardest? I convinced you. <laughs> but what was your hardest? And why? Um, as a social worker, or it's just in general, like mental, because uh, you know, mental health oh. questions. Okay. Um, I think mental health specialists, like, so in exploring mental health, as I transitioned from an eligibility technician where I felt hope, like helpless to, to help other people because I didn't know, um, I, I applied for a mental health uh, specialist position, transitional age youth, uh, children youth services. Uh, so I was dealing with going to the homes and kind of connecting clients to mental health. Um, my first, my first case, and I do remember this. My first case was, um, uh, it was I was told to go out to South County to see a patient. Uh, I was like, excited because uh, the I think it was like a fourteen year old at the time was uh, severely depressed, and um, somehow they had gotten our number and they needed to kind of navigate the system. So how to connect to men, to children youth services mental health. So I drive all the way out to, you know, South County. I have my county cell phone. I'm like, okay, I'm cool. I want to go to Spanish-speaking family. You know, I go in there, and, uh, you know, I, I find out that the reason why this kid was suppressed was because his grandfather had sexually molested him. And in addition to that, the dad had also been sexually molested by the same person, so his father as well. 
And so I'm not only dealing with the 14 year old who is severely depressed, but also dad. And mom feels helpless because she doesn't know what to do. And so I, I, I was totally green, meaning I had like no experience. And I had to like absorb all this information. The dad is crying, the 14 year old is crying because you know, I'm asking them questions about like what happened. I'm assessing for, to make sure that, the, that the, this, this, this person who assaulted them does not have access, this person went to Mexico. So, um, you know, if you're filing a child abuse report, um, you know, if there's, a, if there's an abuser, um, ensure that the abuser is not in the home. Um, so I was kind of trying to do that. Um, but I'm like, okay, you know what? I'm really trying to get some contact information. Let me just go outside really quick. And I'm calling my boss. I'm like, this is what's going on. I really, like, this is my first case. I don't know. So he just gave me guidance. So I think that's kind of walking into, like, I think I got this. So I'm like, what did I get myself into? Like, I was not there. Um, I was able to connect them to the clinic and the, the dad to adult. So both of them. Um, and, the, and they lived in, in South County close to the clinic. And then we did a follow-up to make sure that they did continue therapy. And my goal was just to make sure that they linked. And then I would add them back on. So after they were linked, we closed. We, I closed out. Um, other than that, um, that one was my first one. Um, my first um, death, I think that was probably the hardest for me. Um, and that was while I was working at the hospital, and it was a five-year-old um, who somehow um, she had gotten an infection in the brain through some medication. Um, she had some, some medical issues, um, and the medication had caused um, an infection, um, pretty healthy child. And I was called to provide support to the family because the neurologist was confirming brain death. And um, I, I was in the room um, with the patient, the translator, the mom and the dad, and the five-year-old who is, you know, she, I remember she had, um, she was Latina as well, she had her two ponytails, um, full of hair. She looked like she was just kind of, she was still breathing on her own, fortunately, but um, she just looked like she was kind of sleeping. And the doctor was basically telling the mom that she was brain dead and that she was breathing on her own right now. But as time went by, what was going to happen? She was going to have difficulty. She was going to not be able to have the ability to be on her own. She was going to die. And just the mom, like, I could hear her, you know, gasp and cry. And, um, you know, at that point, you, you have to just be real. It's, it's real. The nurse was crying. I was getting teary eyed. Um, I think that was my first, my first one that I still remember. You know, and you have to be human. You know, and I think that's kind of why you rely on, on self care. Um, because I, I, I remember walking in and in in the hospital, it's it's a skeleton crew. Normally, they have maybe a, a group of maybe thirty to forty social workers that are covering at all times during the week. On the weekend, it's only four of us. And so we rely on each other to really process like what's going on. Like, you know, we'll talk about it. You know, what else can I do? Did I check anything off? Or this is what's going on. So going back in there and kind of processing with like, my other colleagues, I think that was important, but I do remember that one. Um, and then also too, you know, I, I, I remember also that in the hospital, I was giving a bereavement packet to, um, he looked like maybe 30 something and his dad, his mom had passed away. She was already struggling with, with complex medical issues. So they, they, it wasn't a surprise that she was going to pass away, but we still had to give him the breathing packet to make sure that they, they knew what the process was of recovering the body, calling the morgue um, at the hospital, um, making sure that they had funeral arrangements, just checking in and when your mom just passed away, is there anything that we can do, these other resources. And he's like, no, I think we're good. Like, we've been preparing this. He's like, this is what you do? He's like, I'm like, uh, you know, I'm just here to kind of correct. So he's like, man, your job is suck. And then, you know, it's like in retrospect, you know, having to, you know, I walked into to the room when, when a patient has passed away and the family is still there. Um, you know, we're in the hospital, it's, it's a lot more intense. Uh, so I, those are the two ones that I do remember. Any last questions that you are pressed to ask right now in front of everyone or 
Should we wrap up? It's definitely exciting. Social work is definitely exciting. It's not a boring profession, and you can do a lot. So I'm going to disparage you with those two stories. Yes. Did you ever consider MSC? Um, I did not. <laughs> most of most of my mentors were LCSWs. Uh, I've had several MFTs tell me that they wish they would have pursued a social work degree. Uh, I'm going to be a little bit biased. Um, you know, we in our graduate program we complete uh, about a thousand to twelve hundred hours while in school. So your internship hours, your your accruing hours. When you graduate, you have to start all over again. That's all training. So it's 3,200 hours of additional clinical hours that you are accruing. You are perfecting your skills, your interventions, your 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 basically your your study still. You're still a student um, or you're an intern. Um, and so, although it took me maybe two three years to get licensed as a licensed clinical social worker. Um, a lot of MFTs who want, maybe want to apply for a hospital, they can't. Hospitals will sometimes only hire um, social workers. Um, but one of one of my, she's one of my favorite supervisors is also an MFT. She's good. She's good. And she was recently also promoted to like a higher management position. It's just really what you want to do with a degree. I think it does allow you to, to, to do even management. Um, but I think social worker does have a, a social worker degree has a lot more flexibility to work in various agencies, whereas MFPs maybe like family therapy mm -hmm. or, or individual or marriage family therapy. Okay, um, but it, you know again, you know MFPs. Some of, you know, my my favorite supervisor. She was super on top of it, super organized, knows her stuff. Um, she's worked um, with. Clients who are experiencing their first psychosis, meaning they, they kind of start hearing voices, seeing things. Um, she's worked with um, correctional facility youth who were in juvenile hall and probation camps. Um, and then she's also done um, veterans, she's with veterans. So, you know, again, it just really depends on, on, on what you want to do with it and how motivated you are to kind of succeed. With, MFTs, I know that they complete 1,500 hours while they're in school. Once they graduate, they have to complete another 1,500, and then you get their pass. Mm -hmm. But it's, uh, I, I think the way they collect their hours takes a little bit longer versus social work. That's my understanding of it. But for, for social workers, you have to do your hours while in school and then start back. So it's like, you know, when I started, I was like, ah, oh, I have to start. I have, maybe I should have done an MFT program. But no, it's just, it's just part of the process. I do have another question we have typically asked, and that's how you chose, I know you talked about choosing that over MFT, but a lot of students are trying to decide between MSW and a master's in counseling. Mm -hmm. So can you talk about about why you gravitated towards that versus counseling? You could speak on that. Um, well, master's in counseling is the MFT program. Oh, is it? Mm -hmm. and then my understanding is the MFT yeah, program. Oh, okay. yeah. Um, you know, when I graduated, actually, too, I actually applied for my PhD in clinical psychology, um, and I was accepted, but I decided not to go, not to pursue. So I, had, I was supposed to start September, uh, but I was like, I just did my associates, my bachelor's, my master's, I need a break. Will I go back? I don't know. That's a possibility. You know, and it's more, with psychology, clinical psychology, you would do more psychological testing, more individual, um, the court can probably pay you a little bit more. But right now, I think I'm I'm okay where I'm at. Um, you know, I'm still fairly young, I think. So it's I'm not closing that door in terms of pursuing my education. I feel like even even where I'm at right now, I'm always learning. I'm not like I I know that I've been considered an expert on LGBTIQ issues in Orange County, but I I really try not to take on that title because I'm always learning. There's always stuff that I do not know. There's stuff that I have experience in. But stuff that I'm, I'm proficient in, we, we're constantly, I feel like I'm constantly learning. And I feel like if you, if you feel like, oh, I got this, like, you know, that, that's a problem. Because you're, you're constantly asking colleagues. There's something, there's always going to be a different perspective or lens that gets a look at a problem to try to solve. Thank you. 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 Thank you
Thank you so much. No more questions for the students? No? Thank you. Thank you. Let's come around. Let's do the Q&A part. That was a great Q&A session.